Greetings, and welcome back to the channel, as we head into a brand new decade. One that is usually forgotten when discussing the history of sci-fi cinema. Sci-fi filmmaking at the beginning of the 1940s was characterized by sequels, serials, and low-budget B-movies, produced quickly and with modest resources. Icons like Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, in stories blending sci-fi and horror elements, aimed at providing entertaining genre fare during trying times. We'll start off with more Flash Gordon, some forgotten films, the first sci-fi in Technicolor, the first sci-fi horror hybrid starring an all-black cast, and two sequels to The Invisible Man. Before we dive into this year's feature films and serials, I want to highlight one overlooked German short film. Weltraumschiff 1's Startet, or Spaceship One Launches, was directed by Anton Kutter. With its groundbreaking special effects and miniature work, it serves as a reminder of the great German science fiction films of the past and how the genre was ignored by the Nazi regime in the latter half of the 1930s. This 23-minute short film reused footage from two unfinished films that were abandoned due to the war. The filmmakers repurposed the footage to create a short film that shows a realistic manned rocket launch to the moon that is different than many of the American films made at the time, focusing on the scientific and technical aspects of space travel for what was known at the time, rather than adventures in space. In the 1950s, the Hayden Planetarium in New York would use footage from this short as part of the animated series The Space Explorers. It is also a forerunner to 1950's Destination Moon and 1951's When Worlds Collide. To be released, German films had to get approval from the propaganda ministry. But there is little overt Nazi propaganda. It's 23 minutes of German actors playing scientists, showing off their technical superiority. It is an interesting what-if in cinema history. What if the Nazis didn't take control of the German film industry to use for propaganda purposes? What if great filmmakers didn't have to flee the country for Hollywood in the 1930s? And now back to Hollywood and the continuing adventures of Flash, Dale, and Dr. Zarkov. Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe, the third serial in the series, was again produced by Universal Pictures. This black and white serial, spanning 12 episodes, is rooted in Alex Raymond's 1934 comic strip. Directed by Ford Beebe and Ray Taylor, are both notable for their work on action-packed serials. B.B. worked on Buck Rogers, The Phantom Creeps, and The Green Hornet, while Taylor, known for action features, worked on The Spider's Web, which I discussed in my 1938 episode. The story follows Flash Gordon, played by Buster Crabbe, as he faces off, once again, against Charles B. Middleton's Ming the Merciless. Carol Hughes joins the cast as Dale Arden, replacing Gene Rogers, who was now under contract to 20th Century Fox, while Frank Shannon reprises his role as the brilliant Dr. Zarkov. New cast members include Roland Drew as Prince Baron and Shirley Dean as Princess Aura. The story begins with Earth under threat from a deadly plague known as the Purple Death, believed to be the sinister creation of Ming the Merciless. Flash, Dale, and Dr. Zarkov search for a cure. Along the way, they reunite with their friends, Prince Baron and Princess Aura, and their new ally, Queen Freya. Ming survived the last serial and is now aided by Captain Torch and his spy, Lady Sonya. Like many serials of the time, this production was characterized by resourcefulness. Universal Pictures reused sets, costumes, music, and props from previous productions. Additionally, the scenes from the German film White Hell of Pitts Palou were incorporated to enhance the mountain climbing sequence in Episode 2, and the Chamber of Death dust scenes were taken from Buck Rogers. 
its depiction of Ming as a military dictator, instead of the Fu Manchu persona of previous installments, reflected contemporary real-world concerns, drawing parallels to Adolf Hitler and the rising tensions of World War II. He has chosen his own death. The serial was notable for its imaginative sets, art deco designs, and exciting cliffhangers, bringing audiences back week after week. It also used the rolling scroll in the introduction of each episode that was popularized in the 1939 projects Buck Rogers and The Phantom Creeps. These rolling scrolls were later used by George Lucas for his Star Wars films. Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe was shown on television in the 1950s, but the name was changed to Space Soldiers Conquer the Universe, so it didn't conflict with the television series airing at the time. It was also edited into two features in 1966 and shown on PBS in the 1970s. This is one of the better made serials of the time that I really enjoyed. Buster Crab has settled into his role and I didn't find the recasting of Dale Arden too jarring. But the one strange recasting was Princess Aura who looks and acts nothing like the original actress Priscilla Lawson. She's very sweet and innocent now that she's married to Prince Baron. And the Robin Hood style costumes are a bit strange and look like they were just borrowed from another film's costume department. Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe is available on DVD and streaming for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. I recommend checking it out. Before we dive into the films of 1940, if you're enjoying the content, hit like and subscribe for more episodes on the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this incredible genre. Produced by Paramount Pictures, Dr. Cyclops is notable for being the first American science fiction film shot in three-strip Technicolor. Directed by Ernest B. Shudzak, renowned for his work on King Kong and Son of Kong. This film showcases his expertise in blending visual effects into storytelling. The cast is led by Albert Decker as the mad scientist, Dr. Alexander Thorkow. The supporting cast includes a group of unwilling participants in the Doctor's experiments. Thomas Coley as Bill Stockton, Janice Logan in her film debut as Mary Robinson, Charles Halton as Robert Bullfinch, and Victor Killian as Steve Baker. The plot of Dr. Cyclops centers around Dr. Thorkell's experiments in a remote jungle. After summoning a group of American scientists, he decides to shrink them to a fraction of their original size using radiation. The miniaturized scientist must navigate the dangerous jungle and the mad scientist. Despite its innovative special effects and technicolor presentation, the film received mixed reviews upon release. Variety called it dull, while others praised its visual accomplishments. The New York Times called it, quote, the best bad picture of the year. The film was nominated for Best Special Effects at the 13th Academy Awards, losing out to The Thief of Baghdad. This is a quick and fun film that uses color to its advantage to highlight the groundbreaking visual effects and set design. Not the most original story, but the use of cinematography and visual effects creates something worth watching. Dr. Cyclops is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on the Internet Archive. In 1940, Universal Pictures continued its exploration of science fiction and horror with The Invisible Man Returns, the second installment in the Invisible Man series, based on the H.G. Wells novel. This black-and-white film, directed by Austrian filmmaker Joe May, who fled the German film industry for Hollywood in 1933, brought a unique perspective to the series. Unfortunately, Joe May refused to learn English even though he now worked in Hollywood. So star Vincent Price stepped in to translate May's instructions to the cast. The film featured a mix of seasoned actors and emerging talent. 
Cedric Hardwick, renowned for his Shakespearean roles on the stage and in Things to Come, played Richard Cobb. Hardwick would go on to serve as the narrator in 1953's The War of the Worlds. The up-and-coming actor Vincent Price took on the role of the new Invisible Man, Jeffrey Radcliffe. The plot follows Radcliffe, wrongfully convicted of murder, escapes execution with the help of an invisibility serum created by Dr. Frank Griffin, the brother of the original Invisible Man. As Radcliffe seeks to clear his name, he grapples with possible madness, a side effect of the serum. Produced on a budget of $244,000, the Invisible Man grossed an impressive $815,000. Its special effects, particularly the scene where Vincent Price becomes visible, were groundbreaking and earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Special Effects, though it lost to The Thief of Baghdad. The film received mixed reviews. While praised for its suspense and performances, some felt the novelty had worn off since the original film. Nonetheless, its impact was significant, paving the way for sequels and an unofficial Mexican remake. In December, Universal released The Invisible Woman. Directed by A. Edward Sutherland, known for his work with comedy legends like Charlie Chaplin. This film diverged from its predecessors by blending science fiction with screwball comedy. The story centers on Professor Gibbs, played by John Barrymore, who invents an invisibility machine. Virginia Bruce stars as Kitty Carroll, a model who wants to become invisible long enough to settle scores with her tyrannical boss, leading to a series of comedic run-ins with a gang of bumbling criminals. The cast included notable names like Charles Ruggles, John Howard, and Margaret Hamilton, who was coming off a great 1939 with her turn as the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz. Despite a substantial budget of $300,000, the film grossed around $660,000. It was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Special Effects, competing with the films of 1941 because of its late-in-the-year release date and lost out to I Wanted Wings. Critically, The Invisible Woman received mixed reviews. The New York Times called it silly, banal, and repetitious, though they liked Barrymore's performance. The film's unique blend of comedy and science fiction offered a refreshing change of pace, influencing Universal's future productions in the sci-fi comedy genre. Both films, The Invisible Man Returns and The Invisible Woman, highlight Universal's innovative approach to science fiction in 1940. While The Invisible Man Returns maintained a serious tone, The Invisible Woman ventured into comedy, which was a silly change of pace, but it worked for me. The Invisible Man Returns and The Invisible Woman are available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as available for streaming on the Internet Archive. I recommend checking them out. Before I Hang is an American horror and sci-fi hybrid film produced by Columbia Pictures. It's part of the studio's Mad Doctor cycle, which featured Boris Karloff in various roles as men driven to madness by their experiments. The series began in 1939 with The Man They Could Not Hang, which I discussed in my previous episode. Before I Hang was directed by Nick Grind a director and screenwriter known for his work on other films in the Mad Doctor cycle. This marked his third and final collaboration with Karloff. It had an original working title, The Wizard of Death, reflecting on its macabre subject matter, which was changed to Before I Hang during production. That someday, somehow, medical science will find a way to end the needless, ghastly suffering caused by the ravages of age. Boris Karloff stars as Dr. John Garth. Evelyn Keyes, known for her role as Sue Ellen in Gone with the Wind, plays his daughter Martha. Edward Van Sloan, with a distinguished horror film resume including Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Mummy, plays Dr. Ralph Howard. The story begins with Dr. John Garth on trial for the murder 
of an elderly friend whom Garth euthanized to end his suffering. Garth explains to the reporter that he was searching for a cure for aging, but failed to perfect it in time to save his friend. Despite his defense, he is sentenced to be hanged in three weeks. While awaiting his execution, Garth is allowed to continue his research in prison with the help of another doctor. They develop a serum using the blood of an executed prisoner, which they hope will reverse aging. Garth injects the serum on himself just before his execution, but miraculously his sentence is commuted to life imprisonment at the very last moment. The serum's effects work and cause Garth to find that his aging has begun to reverse. After his release, Garth continues his research on new test subjects, but the blood of the murderer mixed with the serum causes him to commit murder instead of helping his patients. While the film may not have achieved the same level of acclaim as some of Karloff's other works, it remains an interesting exploration of the dangers of scientific hubris. In the end, it's another average work in Karloff's career. Before I Hang is available on DVD and to rent on YouTube. It is also available for free on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Monogram Pictures Corporation a studio known for its low-budget horror and science fiction films, produced The Ape, an intriguing yet perplexing entry in the sci-fi genre. The film, directed by William Nye, exemplifies Monogram's taste for rapid production and economical storytelling. The small studio, a prolific producer of B-movies, sought to capitalize on the success of horror films like 1939's Son of Frankenstein. The cast included Maris Rickson as Frances Crawford and Gene O'Donnell as Danny Foster. Ray Crash Corrigan, known for his roles in serials like Undersea Kingdom, wore the cumbersome ape suit. He also played the Orangapoid in 1936's Flash Gordon. The screenplay, adapted by Richard Carroll and Kurt Seedmack, was based on a play by Adam Hall Shirk. The story revolves around Dr. Bernard Adrian, played by Karloff, a scientist obsessed with curing paralysis after his daughter's death. To complete his experimental serum, Adrian needs spinal fluid, leading him down a dark path. The Ape is notable for its rapid production schedule. According to actress Maris Rickson, the film was shot in just one week, starting on August 6th to get it ready for a September 30th release in theaters. Critical reception was mixed. While The Hollywood Reporter and The Los Angeles Times praised Karloff's performance, Variety criticized the film for its lack of suspense and engaging content. The LA Times said of Karloff, quote, No matter how far-fetched the story, he always makes it believable. Its exploration of radical medical experimentation and the moral dilemmas they entail offer a glimpse into the period's cinematic ideas of experimentation. The Ape feels like two different films. There's one that deals with medical experimentation and one dealing with an ape terrorizing the town. The Ape is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below if you would like to check it out. The Man with Nine Lives is a mad scientist film produced by Columbia Pictures. Directed by Nick Grind, this film is loosely based on the life of Dr. Robert Cornish, who famously revived a dead dog using a pioneering technique in 1934. His work was filmed and used in the 1935 film Life Returns. Boris Karloff stars as Dr. Leon Craval, a dedicated scientist working on a revolutionary cancer cure involving cryogenics. The plot centers on Dr. Tim Mason, played by Roger Pryor, a medical researcher who discovers the frozen body of Dr. Craval in a hidden laboratory that he is exploring with his fiancée Judith Blair, played by Joanne Sayers. When Craval is revived, he tells the story of how he got into this predicament. 
Ten years prior, Creval had been experimenting with frozen therapy to cure cancer. But an unfortunate accident led to Creval and a group of men being frozen in ice. The revived patients deal with the consequences of Creval's experiments, leading to a climax where human greed and scientific ambition collide. Despite its low budget, The Man with Nine Lives tries to offer a compelling story that reflects contemporary fears and fascinations with medical advancements. Karloff's performance, as usual, stands out, elevating the film. But the film's imaginative premise doesn't quite pay off. While the film may not be memorable, its exploration of cryogenics and ethical dilemmas in medical science are interesting ideas that are never fully explored. The Man with Nine Lives is available on DVD. It is also available for free on the Internet Archive. Black Friday is a sci-fi horror hybrid from Universal Pictures, directed by Arthur Lubin, known for his 1943 film The Phantom of the Opera, and he's also the creator of the American television series Mr. Ed. This is another Karloff and Lugosi team-up. The film features Boris Karloff as Dr. Ernest Savak and Bella Lugosi as Eric Marnay. Despite their top billing, it is stage and screen actor Stanley Ridges who steals the show. With his dual role as Professor George Kingsley and the gangster Red Cannon. Kurt Seedmack, renowned for his work in horror and science fiction, penned the screenplay. We looked at some of his previous films, FP1 and Twerted Nicked, and Nonstop New York. Eric Taylor co wrote the screenplay. He's known for working on Dick Tracy and The Ghost of Frankenstein. Black Friday begins with Dr. Ernest Sovak, played by Boris Karloff, recounting his story to a reporter as he awaits execution. In a desperate attempt to save his friend, George Kingsley, Sovak transplanted part of the brain of a recently executed gangster, Red Cannon, into Kingsley's body. This procedure results in Kingsley switching between his own sweet nature and the dead gangster's violent personality, reminiscent of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. What follows is Sovak using the memories of the dead gangster to find a hidden fortune while evading other gangsters, led by Eric Marnay, played by Bella Lugosi. Changes to the film were made during pre-production. Originally, the script was titled Friday the 13th, with Karloff initially cast as Kingsley and Red Cannon, and Lugosi as Sovak. But Karloff insisted on playing the doctor. Lugosi was recast as the mobster, and Stanley Ridges was brought in to play Kingsley. Black Friday received mixed reviews upon release. The New York Times stated that Lugosi's talents were wasted. The film's influence is notable in its exploration of brain transplantation, a concept revisited in later science fiction. While watching, I couldn't help but think that Lugosi sounds like Dracula living as a gangster in the 1940s. He knew before he died. I only know that it is planted in a graveyard and I am not afraid of anyone else. And I wish he had a bigger role, or they just gave him his own film. Kingsley in Dual Roles is the standout. It's another one of those average films from the era, but it's always fun to get to see more of Lugosi and Karloff on screen. Black Friday is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. The Devil Bat centers around the vengeful Dr. Paul Carruthers, played by Bella Lugosi. Carruthers, a chemist who feels mistreated by his employers, develops an aftershave lotion that causes genetically altered bats to attack. Carruthers gives the lotion to anyone who feels did him wrong. But a reporter, Johnny Layton, investigates the mysterious deaths and uncovers the deadly scheme. The film is directed by Gene Yarborough, who started his career as a prop man and later became known for his work on B-movies and television, including directing episodes of The Addams Family. Produced by Producers Releasing Corporation, 
a smaller studio known for low-budget B-films. They signed Lugosi in October 1940, hoping to capitalize on his fame. Susie and Karen co-stars as Mary Heath. The comic team of Dave O'Brien and Donald Kerr adds a touch of humor. With O'Brien playing a reporter, Johnny Layton, and Kerr as photographer, One Shot McGuire. We last saw Kerr in his role as Happy Hapgood in Flash Gordon's Trip to Mars in 1938. The Devil Bat was re-released in 1945 in a double bill alongside Man-Made Monster. It spawned a 1946 sequel, Devil Bat's Daughter, and inspired a 2015 sequel, The Revenge of the Devil Bat. I enjoyed this crazy story. Lugosi is always great, and this was a fun but not remarkable film. The visual effects with the bat weren't that great, but it is a low-budget production. The Devil Bat is available on DVD and Blu-ray and is streaming for free on the Internet Archive and YouTube. I recommend checking it out. Son of Nganji is one of those forgotten but culturally significant films in sci-fi and horror history. Featuring the first all-African-American cast for the genre and written by an African-American screenwriter. But it is in no way connected to the 1930 exploitation film in Ganji. The story centers around newlyweds Bob and Eleanor, who inherit a house from a wealthy woman, Dr. Helen Jackson. Unknown to them, Jackson brought an ape-like creature named Ninjina back from her travels in Africa. Ninjina, influenced by a concoction engineered by Dr. Jackson, goes on a murderous rampage, killing Jackson and other members of the town. After kidnapping Eleanor, Ninjina is finally caught. Produced on a very low budget by Producers Releasing Corporation, the film was directed by Richard C. Kahn and written by Spencer Williams, based on his short story, House of Horror. Williams was a pioneering African-American filmmaker who also co-starred in the film as Detective Nelson, and he would go on to direct the 1941 film The Blood of Jesus. The cast includes Zach Williams as Ninjina, Alfred Grant as Bob Lindsay, and Daisy Buford as Eleanor Lindsay. Laura Bowman plays Dr. Helen Jackson, a character that is possibly based on the millionaire Eddie Green. Although the film's very low budget is evident in its poor lighting design and makeup for Ninjina, it avoids the exploitative tropes and presents normal people in unusual situations, while touching on the social and racial issues of the time. The film is slow, but its historical importance and unique place in film history make it worth watching. Son of Nganji is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive and I'll link it in the description below. Sky Bandits is a not very sci-fi type of science fiction film produced by low-budget studio Monogram Pictures. This is a remake of the film Ghost Patrol, which I covered in my 1936 episode. Both versions have little going for them except the tech gadgets developed by a captured scientist to take down airplanes. The film is directed by Ralph Staub, a director, writer, and producer known for his work in comedies and documentaries. The lead role of Sergeant Renfrew is played by James Newell, an opera singer and actor known for his roles in westerns. His casting capitalized on the popularity of singing cowboys. I'm in love with the lady in the cloud. A trend exemplified by Gene Autry's science fiction serial, The Phantom Empire, from 1935. The screenplay was adapted by Edward Halperin from the novel Renfrew Rides the Sky by Laurie York Erskine, a World War I and World War II veteran known for his popular boys' adventure stories. The story centers on Sergeant Renfrew and Constable Kelly, who investigate the disappearance of a plane carrying a shipment of gold. Professor Lewis is forced into developing a powerful ray capable of disrupting electrical impulses. 
allowing his captors to bring down aircraft. Renfrew and his allies, including the professor's daughter Madeline, worked to foil the villain's plans. In 1951, Sky Bandits was edited into a 25-minute TV episode in the Renfrew of the Mounted series. It's one of those that uses the ray gun MacGuffin to drive the plot, a common trope in science fiction films of the time. Unfortunately, it's not a good sci-fi film or a good gangster film. Sky Bandits is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, and I'll link it in the description below. The Mysterious Dr. Satan is a 15-episode serial that centers around the evil plans of Dr. Satan, played by Edward Cianelli, a mad scientist with dreams of world domination with the help of his robots. He faces the Copperhead, played by Robert Wilcox a masked hero and alter ego of Bob Wayne, who aims to stop Dr. Satan from stealing technology needed to complete a robot army. Directed by William Whitney and John English for Republic Pictures, the studio responsible for many of the great serials from the 1930s, including Dick Tracy, The Lone Ranger, and The Fighting Devil Dogs. The pair of Whitney and English worked on 17 serials for Republic. The most interesting thing about the mysterious Dr. Satan is that it was initially conceived as a Superman project, but Republic couldn't get the rights, so they created the Copperhead instead. The serial was edited down to 100 minutes and re-released in 1966 under the title Dr. Satan's Robot. With a budget of just under $150,000, the directors wanted to spend some of that money on new robot designs. William Whitney thought the current design, known as the Republic Robot, needed an update, but he was shut down because it cost too much money. Whitney would go on to describe the robot as looking like a, quote, hot water boiler. Aside from the decent fight scenes and getting to see some robots, this serial should have been edited down to a feature-length film. My main criticism is the Copperhead's costume that is nothing more than a mask that feels like a lazy costuming decision. The Mysterious Dr. Satan is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive, and I'll link them in the description below. Nineteen forty marked the debut of the American science fiction and fantasy pulp magazine, Fantastic Novels. This magazine became another platform for writers to share their imaginative tales with a growing audience of science fiction readers. So let's take a look at some notable science fiction works from 1940. Typewriter in the Sky by L. Ron Hubbard is a story of a man who finds himself transported into the fictional world of a novel, speaking to ideas of reality and authorial control. Final Blackout, also by L. Ron Hubbard, is a dystopian novel first published in serialized form. It depicts a post-apocalyptic Europe ravaged by war. Calicane by Karen Boya is about a scientist who invents a powerful truth serum to extract secrets from those living in a totalitarian world. Synthetic Men of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs is part of his famous Barsoom series involving artificially grown synthetic men. But the most important release of the year was Slan by A. E. Van Vogt, a seminal work about a race of superhumans with telepathic abilities, exploring ideas of persecution and survival. It tells a story of a young member of a telepathic mutant race called Slans. As they navigate a world of oppression and uncover the truth behind his people's origin and survival, the novel's impact on writers is profound as it influenced the creation of the X-Men comic book series by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, as well as influencing the writing style of Philip K. Dick. Despite its influential status, Slan has never been directly adapted into a feature film or television series. This time was a pivotal moment in world history characterized by geopolitical events and the battles of the Second World War. No part of history exists in a vacuum. 
culture, science, the arts, and cinema are influenced by the course of history. And so, when looking at the science fiction films of any time, it is important to understand what else was going on in the world. So for the rest of this episode, I would like to look at some historical, cultural, scientific, and cinematic events that occurred in 1940. The Winter War between the Soviet Union and Finland, which began in November 1939, ended on March 12th with a peace treaty. The Battle of France was a decisive engagement in which German forces rapidly defeated the Allied armies with the overwhelming use of blitzkrieg tactics allowing the Nazis to conquer France in just over six weeks, from May 10th to June 25th. On May 13th, Winston Churchill became the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, succeeding Neville Chamberlain. He delivered his famous blood, toil, tears, and sweat speech to rally the British people. I will say it is to wage war by sea, land, and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us, to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalogue of human crime. The Dunkirk evacuation, which began on May 26 and ended on June 4, was a remarkable feat of Allied resilience, with over 330,000 troops being evacuated from the beaches under intense enemy fire. Following the fall of France, Germany turned its focus to Britain initiating the Battle of Britain in July. The Royal Air Force repelled the German Luftwaffe, forcing Hitler to abandon plans for an invasion. In September, Germany began the Blitz, a sustained bombing campaign against British cities that lasted for eight months. Internationally, the geopolitical landscape shifted as Japan continued its imperial expansion and the Axis Powers Alliance was solidified with the signing of the Tripartite Pact between Germany, Italy, and Japan on September 27th. All of these events collectively underscored a year of significant transformation and set the stage for the ongoing global conflict and its far-reaching impact still felt today. 1940 was also a significant period in cultural history marked by notable contributions across literature, theater, radio, and the emerging field of comic books. On January 5th, the first FM radio station began broadcasting in the United States, in Paxton, Massachusetts. This static-free, high-fidelity broadcasting method would eventually replace AM radio as the standard for radio broadcast. NBC News aired its first regularly scheduled news program on February 21st, anchored by Lowell Thomas. On September 12th, in Lascaux, France, 17,000 cave paintings from the Stone Age were discovered by a hiker. Several important works of literature were published this year. Richard Wright's Native Son, a powerful exploration of race and society in America, was a landmark in American literature. Additionally, Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls became an instant bestseller. Sadly, famed novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald died on December 21st at the age of 44. The world of comic books saw the introduction of several iconic characters. The Joker and Catwoman made their first appearance in Batman No. 1 by DC Comics. Dick Grayson, also known as Robin, was introduced as Batman's sidekick in Detective Comics number 38. Superman's archenemy Lex Luthor debuted in Action Comics number 23. Jay Garrick, known as The Flash, the first superhero with super speed powers, debuted in Flash Comics number 1. Alan Scott as Green Lantern was introduced in All-American Comics number 16. Some major scientific advancements in chemistry, computer science, and aviation include... Carbon-14, a radioactive isotope of carbon, was discovered on February 27th, paving the way for its later use in radiocarbon dating, which became crucial in archaeology and geology. Plutonium was synthesized for the first time on December 14th by a team at the University of California at Berkeley, marking a significant milestone in nuclear chemistry and contributing to the development of nuclear weapons and energy. 
The VS-300 made its first free flight in 1940, becoming the first practical helicopter and laying the foundation for modern rotary wing aviation. Alan Turing and Gordon Welchman designed methods to decrypt the Enigma machine, which played a crucial role in the Allied forces' ability to intercept and understand German military communications during World War II. In 1940, Hollywood's production activities persisted, but the ongoing war significantly disrupted its international business and overseas markets, which were crucial for the industry's revenue. The war in Europe had a profound impact on Hollywood, complicating distribution channels and limiting access to foreign audiences. Despite the continuation of film production, the industry faced challenges in maintaining its financial stability and adapting to the changing global landscape, making this a year that was far from business as usual. The 13th Academy Awards for the films of 1940 were held on February 27, 1941, and marked the first use of the sealed envelopes to prevent the early disclosure of winners, a measure introduced after the previous year's results were leaked to the Los Angeles Times. Alfred Hitchcock's first American film, Rebecca, won Best Picture, while John Ford took home Best Director for The Grapes of Wrath. James Stewart and Ginger Rogers won the leading acting awards for their roles in The Philadelphia Story and Kitty Foyle, respectively. Notably, this ceremony also introduced the Best Original Screenplay category. In the realm of science fiction, Dr. Cyclops and The Invisible Man Returns were nominated for Best Special Effects, showcasing the genre's growing influence in Hollywood, but they lost the award to The Thief of Baghdad. And because of The Invisible Woman's late release date of December 27th, the film was eligible for the 14th Academy Awards held in 1942, where it was also nominated for Best Special Effects. Four classic cartoon characters made their debut in 1940. Tom and Jerry appeared in Puss Gets the Boot, Bugs Bunny debuted in A Wild Hare, and Woody Woodpecker made his first appearance in Knock Knock. Some of the most popular films of the year include Rebecca, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, this psychological thriller about a young bride who is overshadowed by the memory of her husband's first wife, cemented Hitchcock's reputation in Hollywood. It is notable for its atmospheric tension and strong performances by Laurence Olivier and Joan Fontaine. The Philadelphia Story, starring Katharine Hepburn, Cary Grant, and James Stewart. This romantic comedy about a socialite whose wedding plans are complicated by the arrival of her ex-husband and a tabloid journalist. The film was a critical and commercial success, earning Stewart an Oscar for Best Actor. Pinocchio, produced by Walt Disney is an animated film about a wooden puppet who dreams of becoming a real boy. It is celebrated for its groundbreaking animation and memorable songs, winning two Academy Awards. Fantasia, another Disney production, is an experimental film combining classical music with animated segments. Though initially a box office disappointment, it has since become a classic, known for its innovative use of sound and visuals. The Thief of Baghdad, a fantasy film featuring groundbreaking special effects and vibrant technicolor cinematography. It won three Academy Awards and remains influential in the fantasy genre. The Grapes of Wrath, directed by John Ford and based on John Steinbeck's novel, depicts the plight of the Jode family during the Great Depression. The film won two Oscars, including Best Director for Ford and Best Supporting Actress, for Jane Darwell. His Girl Friday, directed by Howard Hawks, is a fast-paced screwball comedy starring Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell as a divorced couple who work together as newspaper reporters. And finally, The Great Dictator, a satirical comedy drama by Charlie Chaplin, critiques Adolf Hitler and the rise of fascism. As Chaplin's first true sound film, it marked a significant departure from his silent film era. The film remains one of his most famous works and was nominated for five Oscars, including Best Picture, 
Best Actor, and Best Writing Original Screenplay for Charlie Chaplin. There were many different types of science fiction to discuss this year that mostly revolved around the mad scientist, robots, experiments, the occasional journeys into space, and one German short film that was technically ahead of its time. The new decade may have started off with only a small bang, but the war would soon consume Hollywood, and the science fiction that would result after 1945 would change the genre forever. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more history of sci-fi content. And I'll see you in 1941.